What's up guys, welcome to Filament TV Reviews. Today I'm reviewing Captain Marvel. This is the, I believe, the 22nd Marvel MCU film. And it's all about Carol Danvers, who has amnesia, who is a Kree warrior fighting against the Skrulls, who ends up on Earth, and she ends up having flashbacks and finding out about herself. And it's a pretty typical superhero origins movie, basically. So what did I think of the film? I thought it was good. It's a good film. By MCU standards, so it's probably middle of the pack, maybe upper middle. It's not one of the best Marvel movies ever made, but it's definitely not one of the worst either. And even if it was one of the worst, it's still a pretty decent film. So, let's talk about the film in a bit more detail then. Structurally, the film has problems because it's kind of all over the place. It has flashbacks, it has visions and dream sequences. And by having the main character have amnesia, it's got a few problems because of that. The structural problems because of her amnesia mean that it's hard to relate to her character at first. It's not until later on when you actually start to find out a bit more about her, when things start to click and when you find out that she is this quirky, really interesting character. So I think it was an odd decision to have her, the first half of the film essentially her being a blank slate. The structural problems, because it is constantly going between the flashbacks and the actual present 1995 stuff, it has pacing and momentum. It has pacing and momentum issues because of that. But ultimately, the film is action-packed. It is fun. I do recommend it if that's what you want from this. Sad, the amnesia bit does still feel a bit tropey. It's not entirely original. It's been done before. I think it's been done better before as well. And like any other superhero film, well not any other superhero film, but a lot of superhero films, the third act does suffer a bit because it kind of falls into typical superhero fare. She's all powerful, she takes down the bad guy, she saves the day. It's very typical, very predictable towards the end. And yeah, it's a little disappointing that that's still a thing today, despite how many superhero films we get. The science fiction elements of the film work really well, I think. It's really cool seeing these Kree worlds and the scrolls and all the technology, the ships, I just love that stuff. It doesn't really go into too much stuff because the majority of the film is set on Earth, that's fine. But I like how it's established how the Kree have this technology and the characters in Black Panther have this technology. Each different race and species has their own technologies, their own gadgets and way of doing things. I think it's really cool how they've established this larger universe in the MCU. So one of the best things about this film is the way in which it subverts expectations. A lot of people don't like that term, but I'm using it. And it does this mainly in the form of the villains. I'm not going to go into spoilers just yet, but there is something about the villains that's really surprising. And there are certain other plot developments where there's twists and turns that change up the formula a little bit and make it a way more enjoyable film than it otherwise would have been. The comedy in the film is problematic though. Every Marvel film has a mix of comedy and drama, and it usually works pretty well. There is some comedy in here that works well. I think Samuel L. Jackson is hilarious at times, but a lot of the comedy just falls flat on its face. And Brie Larson's meant to be this quirky, quippy person. Clearly she's having the ball here, but a lot of the jokes just aren't great. And it's not her fault, I don't think. I think it is a bit of the writing. A lot of them just lack originality and some of the directions surrounding them as well. Uh, they've been given a little too much time sometimes and the punchline doesn't quite land. So I've talked about how there are some twists and turns in here. Because they're doing so many big twists and turns, there are certain things that end up not making sense towards the end. I'll get into spoilers and a bit more details on that later on. But this does bring up some problems. It means that if you actually think about this film too much, it's probably going to be worse than you originally thought. And it is a very fun and enjoyable film, regardless of these problems. So let's talk about the characters and the actors. Brie Larson is Captain Marvel. She's brilliant. She's really good. I love her costume. I think it's one of the best Marvel costumes we've ever had. It doesn't over-sexualize her. It's not giving her curves. It's not showing her bust or shape or figure or anything. It really is just, this is a practical costume for fighting and for being in space and being a warrior. It's really well done and it looks cool as anything. And yeah, really good costume. Brie Larson, great performance. Again, 
she does suffer in the first half by having basically a blank slate of a character and then towards the end she is this all-powerful superhero character. We'll get into a bit more on that in just a bit. Samuel L. Jackson is here. The de-aging stuff used to make him younger is brilliant. You really can't tell at times. It is a mix of makeup and CGI. He's also way more loose. He seems to be having a lot more fun than in previous Marvel movies. In previous Marvel movies that he's in, he's very serious and almost intense and intimidating. Here, that's not the case. So it's good to see how they've altered his character a bit because of the time difference. Ben Mendelsohn is brilliant in this film. I'm not going to go into too much detail about him, but he is the scroll lead. He is the scroll leader in this movie, and he's a, just a brilliant actor, and he does a good job here. Again, I'm going to go into spoiler territory later on. There's a lot of things I can only really hint at here because there are so many twists and turns. I can't go into too much detail. So I was talking about how Brie Larson's great, but there is something towards the end where there's a problem. All superheroes kind of have this moment where they go from being just someone with powers, gifts and abilities to being something more, something more heroic. So the key example I want to give is Wonder Woman. She's this big iconic figure and then in Wonder Woman, the recent movie, there's the no man's land scene when she just says, you know what, I'll lead the way and she just goes straight into the no man's land, charges straight for the Germans and leads the allies to victory. It's a brilliant moment. It takes her from being a warrior to a hero. Sadly, Brie Larson doesn't really have a moment like that. She's kind of the same all the way throughout the film, except that she gets her memories. And the problem is that there is kind of a moment like this, but it happens in flashback, which means that when the film starts, this has already happened. She's already transcended to becoming a superhero. She just doesn't know about it until the end of the film again. So, yeah, it's a little odd. It's a structural problem. I think some of the editing, they might have been able to do it a bit more chronologically, maybe. But I don't know if that would have improved the film or not. But it would have certainly made the film run smoother in terms of pace and the momentum. Phil Coulson's back. I'm glad about that. I really like Clark Gregg. I like that character a lot. If you've watched Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., he has been still kicking around in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, if you want to consider it canon or not. That's debatable. But he's back. Like Samuel L. Jackson, he's got the de-aging stuff going on. But unlike Samuel L. Jackson, his doesn't quite work as well. It really gives him like a milky, creamy complexion. And I've got to imagine it's because maybe... Because he's younger than Samuel L. Jackson, maybe they had less films and less work to relate from in the 90s when he was that age. So it does look like heavy CGI and a bit of a dodgy wig on him. But sadly, his character is not in this film too much. That's disappointing. Made a big deal about him being back and he just pops up every now and then. But it is the Phil Coulson we all know and love. Annette Benin is in this film, a really unusual, odd film for her to be in. She usually does more indie dramas, and great actress, completely wasted in this film, though. She did not have to do this role at all. The role, very boring, very bland, not much to it. And, yeah, it makes me wonder why she chose to do this, because she's better than this. And it's not that her performance is bad, it's just the character's bad. They've also made a big deal about Jaiman Honsu and Lee Pace being back in this movie because they were in Guardians of the Galaxy. And it seems like Lee Pace was doing his role all in one day, maybe. Every time you see him, he's stood in the same pose, in the same outfit, looking the same way. It is Lee Pace playing Ronin from Guardians of the Galaxy, but very small role, pretty much a cameo, really. And I'm not going to go into too much about his role in this film, but... It's disappointing how they made such a big deal about it when he's not that big a character in the film. Jaiman is in the film a bit more than Lee Pace, and that's good to see. It's good to see him on, I want to see the good side, maybe. I don't want to go into spoilers, but yeah, he does get more to do in this film. He's a good actor as well. Yeah, I wouldn't go to see this film just because they're bringing these actors back, but they're there. They've got small roles in the movie. Not much I want to say about that. So production, this is a Marvel movie. It is a big 
budget CGI filled superhero film and there's a lot of CGI. The CGI is really good. Towards the end I think it goes a little over the top at times when she does get her full powers and you get like the shiny Mohawk and the big outfit and so on. It, I think they go a little over the top with it all and it becomes a little bit superhero CGI action there. One of the big things about this film is that it's set in 1995. They made a big deal about this and in the trailers they constantly point out the blockbuster. That's kind of the only reference you get about the 90s. There is 90s related music in the movie but it feels really forced in. It's really on the nose at times. They could have chose some better songs that were more suitable and a bit more subtle let's say. And you could say well this is the music that Brie Larson's character would have lived listen to because of the time period well no you can't really because that she has lost six years of her life because of amnesia she has no idea what these songs are so these songs that they are in this film no relation to her whatsoever so they really are just forced in whereas in guardians of the galaxy if you remember the songs were related to his character these were the literal songs that he listened to this is not the case at all here in this movie, and it, it's disappointing. But it's not just licensed music, there is a really, really good score. I would say one of the best Marvel scores to date, and I've got lots of Star Wars vibes from it, so that's a thumbs up for me. But uh, yeah, good score, I like the score a lot. Sets the mood, sets the tone, makes it really wonderful and amazing at times. I've talked about the editing and the flashbacks, they're problematic, really problematic at times. I would say it's only a problem so much in the first half of the movie when there there is a lot of heavy flashback and vision material. But that's all I've got to say about Captain Marvel without going into spoilers. I thought it was good. It's a very fun and enjoyable Marvel movie. Very middle of the road Marvel movie though. But hey, that's still good. And Brie Larson's great in it. I do recommend you see this. Do you have to see it before Avengers Endgame? Probably not, no. It doesn't really tie into Avengers Endgame. And the only real reason to say it before Avengers Endgame is to get an idea of who Captain Marvel is if you don't already know who she is. But I imagine there's going to be something in Avengers Endgame that does that for you as well. So, that's all I've got to say about the movie without going into spoilers. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the underscore Grant Burton. I'd appreciate that. Subscribe to my channel as well. I'd really appreciate that. Thumbs up. Comments down below, feedback, let me know what you thought of Captain Marvel. And until next time, thanks for watching. But, full spoilers now. If you haven't seen the movie, go watch the movie, come back, watch the rest of this. So the big twist in this movie is that the scrolls aren't the bad guys. It's the first half of the movie, you think they are. Ben Mendelsohn is very much set up as the villain of the film. But then halfway through it's like, no, he's actually a really sympathetic character, and he's actually the good guy. The problem with this twist, though, is that it makes you think about what's happened before. Because earlier in the film, the schools were actively trying to kill Captain Marvel. No questions or qualms about it. They were trying to kill her. There's a moment where there's a scroll on a building with a sniper rifle that actually shoots at her. And she turns around and, well, she tries to kill the scroll in return. So, one minute, there trying to kill each other, next minute it's like, whoa, 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 we're actually on the same side, you know, and it's like, eh, it, it's a little sudden, the, the change that they have, and why would Captain Marvel listen to them, because at that moment, she doesn't really know what's going on, because of her amnesia, so this is a, a prequel, it's in 1995, and you might have noticed Nick Fury has two eyes in this movie, I really liked how they addressed that, how he lost his eye, there is the stuff with the cat throughout the film, that's overused a bit, the cats, some of the cat stuff's funny, but there's just too much of it, but the cat basically scratches his eye out, and it's a funny moment, it's a funny scene, because it is just a little scratch, his eye's fine, but then the camera turns over to Ben Mendelsohn, who's like, Ooh. and he's like, no, it's not, <laughs> and that's how Nick Fury lost his sight, and yeah, pretty cool, pretty funny, I like that. So I talked about how the cat is overused. The big problem with the cat is that they never really go into explaining what it is, where it's from, how it's there, or anything. All we know is it's meant to be some sort of alien creature. And does this mean all cats are alien creatures like this? 
or is it just this particular cat? Where did this cat come from? Why is this cat here? What's it doing? We don't know. Because the cat just kind of wanders around this military base and finds Captain Marvel. That's the very first time we see her, this cat. Why is it in this military base? They never explain any of this about the cat. And sure, maybe comic book fans will like it. Maybe comic book fans will have a better understanding of it. But I haven't read any Captain Marvel comic books. I don't know anything about this cat. And the cat has a big role in the film. It's constantly there, constantly contributing to things. Usually in a comedic purpose. So I would have liked to have known a bit more about it. So the scrolls aren't the villain. So who is the villain? It's Jude Law. Jude Law's character is the villain. What was his plan? To use Captain Marvel, I think. Yes. He wanted to control her power. He wanted to use Captain Marvel to help the Kree win the war. Is that his plan? I don't know. It doesn't really go into details. It didn't really quite make sense. Especially when at the same time he's trying to limit her power. So what was his plan exactly? How could he use Captain Marvel when he's deliberately trying to prevent her but from being able to use her powers? Also, was he never expecting her to get her memories back? Yeah, a lot of questions, and that's all to do with the big plot twists. It kind of turns things on its head, and you have to think about things in a different, from a different angle. And that's when the problems occur, like this. Like, what was Jude Law's plan all along? But at the end of the day, Jude Law doesn't die. He just gets sent back to his homeworld, basically. And... Sure, that's probably setting up for a sequel, but it's a little odd how the villain basically was just let go. In fact, I don't think, with a couple of exceptions, no villains died. No major villains died in this movie. Lee Pace shows up towards the end, and he's like, oh, you're powerful. We better get out of here. And that's how he survives. Jaiman Honsu, meanwhile, he just vanishes. Captain Maul fights him on a ship, and then that's the last we see of him. We know he survives because he's in Guardians of the Galaxy. But there are some odd little things like this where there are just unsolved little elements that aren't really divulged in that much. So that's kind of all I've got to say about Captain Marvel. It's a good film. I liked it. It's very fun, very exciting and entertaining, and I recommend it. You don't have to see it before Avengers Endgame, though. It doesn't really tie into that. There is a post credit scene that does, but... That post credit scene, very likely going to be in Avengers Endgame. There's another post credit scene where the cat throws up the Tesseract, and now we know how the Tesseract ends up in the hands of S.H.I.E.L.D. Again, kind of. Again, this is an element the Tesseract is in this film. The timeline surrounding this does become a bit convoluted and confusing at times, because it means it must have shifted hands multiple times. Because the last time we saw the Tesseract in Captain... America, the first Avenger, the Tesseract's picked up by Dominic Cooper. It's then suggested that he's working on it. The next time we actually see it was the beginning of Avengers, when S.H.I.E.L.D.'s working on it. So now we know that some point between Captain America and Captain Marvel, Dominic Cooper must have gave the Tesseract to S.H.I.E.L.D., and then the cat got the Tesseract, then they... Tesseract went back to S.H.I.E.L.D. It's all really confusing at times. But I, I'm digressing a bit. That's Captain Marvel. Subscribe to my channel. Like this video. Yada yada yada. At Lee underscore Grant Burton. Twitter Instagram. Thanks for watching.